Hello and welcome to Act One, Scene Four of Playdate. This is our March Madness episode, and we are joined by both theatrical and basketball experts from the Family Court Vision podcast. <laughs> so welcome Hello. to uh, Playdate. Yeah, thanks Hi. for having us on. Thank you. So, of course, we love your show. Um, we've talked about uh, the, the first couple episodes that we've listened to, and I mean, it's 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 hilarious. I mean, it's it's like the perfect balance of like comedy and it's educational. If if you don't know it, anybody who's listening to us, go follow them. Uh, I'm just gonna plug it right away because it's that good. Thank you very much. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, educational for me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So we're going to we're going to go right ahead and start off with our trivia. So um, obviously the way that this works is that each of us has our trivia questions and we all have to take guesses on each other's um, to just kind of introduce our audience uh, to us a little bit more um, to get to know everybody. So why don't we have um, our, our guests start? Jack, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay. Um, so my, it's going to be a two truths and a lie. And um, the the theme of this two truths and a lie is Jack is bad at sports. That's the theme. <laughs> <laughs> I like sport. I like sports. I like talking about sports. I like watching sports, but physically playing them, uh, different story. So um, here are my three. And mom, you might know the answer, so you might want to sit out on this one. But, I, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So the first one is I once scored for the other team in a basketball game. The second one is um, on my flag football team that I was the quarterback of, uh, we went completely defeated, meaning we lost every single game in the season. We didn't win a single game. (laughs) Um, And then the third one is I once dropped a foul ball at a Mets game, and it it bounced off my glove that I brought and bounced away, and somebody else got the ball. I am going to say that the last one is a lie. The Mets game. Okay. I'm going to say that... The first one is a lie. And I feel stressed because I'm your mom. So I feel like I should know <laughs> these. Like if the, the the first two would have been games you would have been playing in and I probably should have been paying attention. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I'm going to guess the third one. I'm with Katie on that. <laughs> uh, you both are correct. It's the third one was a lie. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Job, that was that sweat. Oh, that sweat. That was surreal. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Yes, good job. Good job, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Why don't we pass it right off to you then, Lori? All right. Um, two truths and a lie. I sustained a basketball injury two years ago that made me um, unable to walk for a short while. I almost traveled to China the summer after my sophomore year of college. And something related to this play is the reason that Jack is in existence. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to say the first one is a lie. The basketball injury. Yes. I believe your injuries are true and I'm not sure if they were caused by basketball. <laughs> I agree with Katie. I'm going to go with that one as well. Um, again, as a direct family member, I'm not sure about this. Um <laughs> I think we need to talk more, Jack. But yeah, yeah, clearly. <laughs> um, so, but I think I'm going to go with the second one. The traveling to China. Yes. Uh, Jack, you are correct. <sighs> okay. Yes. Looks yeah. like we're fine, Mom. We're fine. Yeah, another yeah, okay. another wipe of the brow for the Levin. Yeah. Fan. Yeah. Wait, so so what, yeah. What what in this play is the reason that I exist? Well, just back to the basketball injury that you and I were playing basketball a couple <laughs> yeah. of years ago. And uh, I landed hard on my foot and that was, it was bad. We, yeah. we were going to Boston the next day and I could, I had to walk on my toes because my heel felt like it was broken. Oh, no. So yeah, oh, Jack, Jack injured me in a basketball game. His 50 uh, something year old mother. Don't, don't what kind say of it like that. That. <laughs> All right. So what related to this play brought you into existence? Well, um, when this play I always read all the who was in this play things. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Uh, so when it was okay. when it was at the Atlantic Theater Company, B.D. Wong was in this play. And I 
don't have a theater history, but um, my freshman year of college, I saw my first Broadway show, which was Cats. Surprising that I'm still a theater person. Yeah, what a way to start. What a way to start. (laughs) My sophomore year of college is when I met Jack's dad, Andy. um, And one of our first dates was to see a show called M Butterfly, which was B.D. Wong's um, debut, Broadway debut. So we saw, we were in the second or third row. We saw B.D. Wong in that show. And full circle, B.D. Wong was in, in The Great Leap as well. Wow. That's so interesting. What a so, cool little what a cool little family fact. Thank you. I thank you, it. BD Wong. <laughs> thank you, BD Wong. For mm-hmm. me, yes. <laughs> All right, Julia, why don't you go ahead? Okay. I have a very similar um theme to Jack's. It's just Julia's bad at sports. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm doing two truths, two truths and a lie. Um which of the following of Julia's sports stories is false? Um, number one, on the first day of co-ed physical education, Julia got hit in the head with a soccer ball and blacked out for a few seconds. <laughs> number two, in the middle of her family's annual Thanksgiving football game, Julia got hit in the face with a sneaker and got a black eye. <laughs> <laughs> number three, When Julia was six years old, her brother hit her in the face with a basketball, and she then proceeded to run into a tree. I'm going, I'm going number two. I'm going number two as well. I'm going to go number one. Number two is correct. Ah. That actually happened to my brother. It didn't happen to me. Mm. Ah, So he had a black eye on Black Friday. I feel like I've heard the, I feel like I've heard the story of the, the first story. It just checks out. I feel, yeah. I, I feel like I don't even really need to know the history. Just knowing you as a person, that just checks out. I just blacked out for a couple seconds. You Julia blacked out is what you did. Oh, look at that. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Um, I also have two truths and a lie, so we're four look for that. four. Um, but mine is not is not Katie is bad at sports. Mine is Katie is weirdly good at sports. Um, uh as a theater major, it's a super weird thing. Um, so these are my two truths and a lie. So number one, I played varsity tennis in high school. Number two, I was on an all-star lacrosse team for two years. And number three, I was a member of a rock climbing team. I feel bad that I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'm going to guess number one. I am also guessing number one. I'm going to guess number one as well. We're all- you were all correct. Yes. Yeah, you're all correct. I played varsity track and field, but I was kicked off of the tennis tennis and I did flat Stanley instead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so, so next up, I would love to know everybody's experience with basketball. Oh. I was not okay. expecting this. Well, um, I, I have I have that basketball injury. That's, that's right. Uh, that's yeah. that's basically it. Other than I recently became a fan of WNBA and I watched every New York Liberty game in the bubble last summer and became a big fan of the Liberty. You also Peace. co-host a basketball podcast as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I forgot. Yeah. Well, I don't think that takes any experience with basketball from me. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, my, uh, I've been a big basketball fan. I've been a basketball fan for over a decade, a big, huge fanatic for the last five or six years. Um, and I co-host a basketball podcast. So that's, (laughs) that's my, uh, that's my, my involvement. Have you ever played basketball, Jack? Um, I did when I, when I scored for the other team, um, (laughs) was, it was like a, you know, the equivalent of, of little league, but for basketball, I played for a good number of years. Um, but yeah, no, no, like no school basketball or anything like that. I, I preferred that, that sport because none of you guys were any good at sports. So if I could sit (laughs) inside and watch you play, that was a preference (laughs) for me. No offense, Jack. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I I understand. I understand. <laughs> That's so funny. Julia, what about you? Do you have any experience with basketball? 
Weirdly, yes. Um, so my family does have an annual football game, but recently my grandpa has started like renting out the gym at the boys and girls club near where he lives. And we all have a family basketball game. Um, and I am very much the black sheep of my family in that I chose to do theater for a living and everyone else in my family is really, really sporty and like wins awards for it and stuff. Um, so I, I was like, t- I'm terrified of basketballs flying at my face because of the childhood trauma I just told you all about. Um, <laughs> so my aunt Judy was, was trying to help me <laughs> just get through these games of basketball, which I, I just was like trying my best. <laughs> but yeah, that's my experience with basketball. That's so what funny. about you, Katie? <clears throat> um, I played... Like I played a, I played a little bit when I was younger. Um, I played point guard when yeah. I was younger, which is which is hilarious because I am like four feet tall, um, and I just haven't grown since I was like in fifth grade. Um, so I'm obviously way too short to play now. But I played one year when I was in high school, um, and my brother was a coach. It was kind of like like you said, Jack, like almost like a little league team, but not like a a official team of the school mm-hmm. um and i played i scored once um for, and it was for the other team for the other team or for your own team <laughs> i honestly don't remember <laughs> it's a 50-50 chance. <laughs> um but i don't i don't watch basketball at all i like don't know anything about basketball except for lebron james and that's solely from jack <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad that's the most important one so thank you yeah Katie, I have a brand new obsession. Does it involve music and candles? You know it. Then it's got to be Sense Memory. Their soy vegan candles are natural, good for the planet, and 100% homemade. These candles make the perfect gift for friends and family because not only do they have these fun themes, but each candle also comes with a corresponding personally curated Spotify playlist to set the mood. My best friend is the biggest T-Swift fan in the world, and she absolutely loved the Folklore Evermore and Cottage Core candle I gave her this Christmas. I tried out the Cocoa Butter Bitch candle, and let me tell you, Katie, I felt like a classy lady. If that isn't enough to win you over, shipping is covered in the price of the candle. Yeah, I'll say that again. Shipping is covered in the price of the candle so that you can say goodbye to all these hidden fees and say hello to supporting small business owners. Not to mention that every time you purchase a candle with Sense Memory, you are directly supporting an arts organization. To find your perfect candle, visit caitlincrawl.com slash sensememory or follow them at sense.memory on Instagram. That's at S-C-E-N-T-S dot memory on Instagram. Um, does anybody have any experience with the show at all? Like, has anybody ever read it before, uh, before preparing for this podcast or know anything about it? No, this yeah. one, this, when, when you guys uh, invited us on, this was my first time even hearing of it. So oh, this yeah, was the first brand time new for everybody. Yeah. Very exciting. Um, so, well, and I would like to start it off with a question for you, uh, Jack, I feel like you're, you would know the most out of um, <clears throat> out of the group, uh, but in the character descriptions, um, the playwright is talking a little bit about uh, some some characters and stuff, and um, and they said that that um, one of the characters of Manford, who we'll explain in the in our our you know intro and learning about the author, but I figured I would ask this right away. Mm-hmm. Um, it says, "quote more Alan Iverson than Jeremy Lin." Uh huh. Who are these people? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really liked because she she did that um, for all four of them. She had like an NBA player comparison, um, and I I took some notes that um, well, Jeremy Lin I think is a really important um, person in the Asian American community. Um, there have been very 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 few um, NBA players of Asian descent, um, and he um, about a decade ago. Uh, played for the Knicks and had this like two week stretch where he was like, cra- he was just hitting game winning shots and going crazy and winning like mm-hmm. they called it Lin Sanity, Jeremy Lin Lin Sanity, um, and it was this huge huge thing. 
for the Knicks and for him, uh, but specifically for Asian American fans of the sport or Asian, you know, Asian fans of the sport um, anywhere around the world. Um, but I think um, it's interesting because Allen Iverson um, was a player. He's an all time great player. And he's uh, specifically known for being a short player. He was much shorter than everybody else. He actually went to jail his senior year of high school, and he had to like beg um, coaches to let him play for the college team. He had a great like first three years of high school, um, but because of this kind of legal trouble that he got in his senior year, um, he had a lot of trouble get playing on a college team, and eventually he got onto. Uh, the Georgetown team uh, for Coach Don Thompson. Uh, he was a very aggressive player. He liked showing off his skills. He was kind of a showy player, um, and he had this this famous crossover was his was his famous play. Um, and so all of those directly relate to the character of of Manford. He's an aggressive player. He has to fight for the opportunities that he's that he he wants. Um, and it says in there something about like he has a killer crossover or something like that. Yeah. So. I really oh, liked so all cool. those player comparisons. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I like cool. those too. And, and Katie, I'm glad you brought those up, but I found it really interesting. Um, I read that um, Lauren Yee, although her father in, we may talk about this in the author's note, she talks about that her father is, was a, is a major basketball fan, but she said she had to do research for this because she has limited basketball knowledge. So knowing that she has limited basketball knowledge and likely the people reading and going to perform this play you know, not to stereotype theater people, but probably also have limited basketball knowledge. It was interesting to me that she included those comparisons because maybe it was so that you would go and look them up and learn a little more about basketball. I don't know, but I found that interesting. Yeah, I mean, it really just shows how how detailed and <clears throat> specific she is of a playwright um, to have done that research on her own find the people that she felt best described each of these characters and then put it in to help other actors doing the roles. I feel like that's a very, uh, just a, it's a lot of really smart work that she did mm -hmm. in yes. that. Um, so Julia, do you want to tell everybody what this show is about? Absolutely. So this synopsis is from the New Play Exchange website. When an American college basketball team travels to Beijing for an exhibition game in 1989, the drama on the court goes deeper than the strain between their countries. For two men with a past and one teen with a future, it's a chance to, take, to stake their moment in history and claim personal victories off the scoreboard. American coach Saul grapples with his relevance to the sport. Chinese coach Wen Chang must decide his role in his rapidly changing country and Chinese American player Manford seeks a lost connection. Tensions rise right up to the final buzzer as history collides with the action in the stadium, inspired by the events in the life of the playwright's own father. Do you want to talk a little um, bit about Lauren Yee? Yeah, so um, Lauren Yee was uh, born and raised in San Francisco. She lives in New York, New York City today. Um, and and I, I'm going to be 100% honest, I, I really didn't know any of her work um, before reading this play. Um, and, and when I was looking up all of the stuff she wrote, I was like, holy crap, like, she's written so many things and that have been like well-produced all, all over the, the world. And I had no idea. Um, so some of them, some of her most famous works include the Cam Cambodian rock band, um, The Great Leap, which is the show we're talking about now, uh, King of the Yees, Ching Chong Chin Man, uh, The Hatchmaker's Wife, The Song of Summer, just like the list goes on and on and on. Um, and she's won an amazing, like incredible amount of awards. Uh, the Doris Duke Artist Award, the Steinberg Playwright Award, the Horton Foot Prize, um, the Kessel Ring Prize, the ATCA Steinberg Award, the American Academy of the Arts and Letters Literature Award, the Francesca Primus Prize, just like easy. Um, she's, done, she's done tons of work for the Sage Inn and she's actually worked with Apple, uh, the company of Apple and Netflix right now. Um, and she received her BA from Yale and her MFA from the University of California, San Diego. Um, and and as they mentioned, this play is inspired by events uh, by events that her her father um, third from his life. Uh, so that makes us, that that makes play all the more interesting. More interesting, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And we should. So, also did anybody have any? Um, oh, go ahead. We go should ahead, also mention for our <laughs> listeners if you're reading this play. Um, Trigger warning, there are both racist and ableist slurs used in this text, so just be wary of that before you read. Um, did anybody have any uh, just initial thoughts? 
from reading the play? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I want I want to talk about the the description in the the front of the play um, where she she says this is a play about basketball, but it is also a basketball play. The game is reflected not just in the subject matter, but the rhythm, structure, language, and how the characters move through space. We should have a sense that someone is always watching. And um, on our podcast, we every week we do a review of basketball movies, and we talk a lot about what makes something a basketball movie versus just a general sports movie or something else movie. Right. And that could have any sport and, in it. Right. And often what we found is that basketball is used as a way to discuss things like race, things like socioeconomic class, things like that, because basketball um, is a, a sport that can be played by anyone at any time. You don't need equipment. You don't need a lot of players. You can just, you and your friend can go out and play one-on-one. As long as there's a hoop and you have a ball, you can play. So, and, and um, in, in poor, in any neighborhood, really, but in poor urban neighborhoods, there's always a playground with basketball. It might have no net. It might have chains on it, but there's always a net, There's always a basketball hoop. So kids, no matter their socioeconomic status, can always play. Right. And in these in these stories, in these movies, it's often basketball is often used as a way for those people who are in maybe harder situations to get themselves out, to go play at a college, go play at a professional level, provide for their family, that sort of thing. Um, and what what our discussions often focus around are black players, because that's often what these stories are focused around. And this story while also about race and ethnicity, was about Asian players or Asian American players. And so um, I, I do think it it is a little bit of a different discussion, but it is still a basketball story because that seems to be what... Bas- so it's not just about basketball, but it is a basketball story. It's somebody who's in a situation that they're not happy with, and they use the sport of basketball to get out of that situation. Multiple characters in this story do that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I... Um, I, I... You know, one of the things that I had taken note of very, very quickly for very obvious reasons, because it's pretty consistent, as Julia mentioned throughout it, which is is the racism that is seen pretty much from the get go in this play and mainly um, by uh, the American coach, Mm -hmm. um, really, is is who's kind of doing most of that Mm -hmm. talking. And so I I, a question really for both of you, Jack and Lori. Um, like you said, you, you kind of touch mainly on, uh, black players in the NBA. Um, but I was wondering, like in your experience, both of you watching the NBA and the WNBA, um, what sort of diversity or, or lack thereof, um, do you see on the court, um, other than, you know, kind of just black people and white people? Is there really, how much diversity do we see in between? Um, yeah, not, not, a, not a ton, if you're just talking about besides black and white players, um, there's, I think there's only one, um, one current NBA player who is, uh, was born in Asia or like is, uh, has Asian descent. Um, and that's Rui Hachimura of the, um, Washington Wizards. Um, now it is, uh, you know, more diverse than, a lot of places, I think that I think it's seven in ten players are are black in the NBA, um, something like that. Um, but there is, uh, I've talked a lot about the lack of diversity in coaching because right. that that uh, is not very reflective of the players themselves, uh, management, general managers, owners, that sort of thing. Um, those are predominantly white people, and and gender disparity as well. We know that in the players in the NBA in the MNBA are men, um, but the executives and coaches tend to be men as well. There was just a a woman recently who acted as head coach for a portion of a game. And that was the first time in history that that happened. And even in the WNBA, we see a lot of, um, not, not strictly, but we see a lot of men who are coaching women's basketball. When I read something that I'm going to talk about, I take notes. So Um, a quote in letter one, something that frustrated me about this play actually was the scenes were just called scene. So I don't know how that works if someone's rehearsing or discussing it. Oh, turn to scene. Um, But the letters were numbered. So in letter one, there was a quote that said, this is the story not of the team, but of the coaches, not of those who run, 
but of those who stand still. And I thought that was just a straightforward description of coaches. Coaches are not the ones who are playing, they're standing still. But as the play progresses, we see that the characters of the two coaches in their in the 18 years that have elapsed, how much they've each stood still in their lives. So I, I really like that um, meanings change as you learn more about the, the characters and the situation. Yeah. And bouncing off of that, um, one of my favorite lines was when Wen Chang is like, I loved her like I loved bas- basketball from afar. And that takes on a whole new meaning in the second half of the show as we find out that he didn't follow her to America. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Something I really what- liked about the the structure of the play was that almost every single scene was just sort of this one-on-one showdown almost. Um and it was, you know, in a, in a lot of scenes in plays, you find that, you know, character A has this objective and character B has this objective and those intercede and they cross and that's why there's conflict. Where this was like, character A wants this thing and character B specifically wants to stop character A from getting that one thing. And it reminded me a lot of basketball, of especially like I talked about these one-on-one matchups that you have, which is one player is specifically trying to score and the other place player is specifically trying to stop them from scoring. Um, you did, I think the only time you had like a group scene where three different people were talking to each other at once was briefly when uh, like Connie went to talk to Saul and then Manfred showed up for like a second. And then at the end, like that scene is technically a group scene, but they're not like talking to each other um, where, where most of the show is just one character showdown with another character. So I think it, mirrored basketball itself which was really cool i never even thought of that i never even noticed that that's such a cool thing to pick up on um you know i the biggest thing that as i was reading this kind of bouncing right off of that of that dialogue that's going back and forth just between two two people um is how well meisner technique would work in the rehearsal room with this show um meisner technique is a form of acting specifically focusing really on on your partner and you know kind of going in with a certain knowledge and then letting the energy of the scene kind of change and influence the way that you go um and in similarly to Meisner in your you know kind of as you're learning it or in your technique of it you um come into the room with a specific objective like I said and then it just kind of goes back and forth and like you said one person is going to get something and the other is actively trying to make that not happen. And I would be so interested to see in the rehearsal room if putting in a little bit of that technique, uh, kind of how that would change and shift and shape the the show as a whole and the relationships of the, the not only the characters, but the actors themselves in learning how to bounce this quick dialogue off of each other. Um, because even like she, like uh, Lauren Yee said, um, in when in the description of the play, um, how it should be reflective, like the pace should be reflective of the game itself. And basketball is a very fast game. It's mm-hmm. such a fast game. And the dialogue in this, it's like they're completing each other's sentences. They're just bouncing right off of each other. It is exactly reflective of the speed of basketball. So I'd be interested to see how Meisner kind of like would affect that in one way or, or another. I liked I liked some of the humor. There was a lot of humor throughout it. Yeah. And I liked early in the play, um, I think it was when Wen Cheng and um, Saul were talking and Saul was teaching about basketball and he uses the phrase pick it and stick it and then discuss, dis- discusses that it's a roll. And then I think Wen Cheng says, why don't we call it pick and roll? And, and he says, oh, that phrase will never catch on. And although I don't 100% know what a pick and roll is, I know that that is a basketball thing. Um, so obviously that phrase has caught on. Um, so I thought that was a fun little, you know, fun little inside jokes for the basketball fans. Uh, you you know, know, in that exact scene, Lori, I, I also took a note about the humor because there was a specific line where um i don't remember who was saying it to who one of them said screamed in all caps cover your penis and he's he's very clearly talking about a pick like Uh in basketball like that's clearly what he's he's doing but that that's never said and it's never you know explained in the play and it's like a nice little nod to the basketball fans of the play who like will understand what that means and nobody else really will um and i think that's very clever 
the word play in, in the scenes between Saul and, and Wen Chang are just incredible. And mm-hmm. Even just a joke as simple as um, Saul going, that was a joke. And <laughs> I'm going, okay, but jokes are funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about the, <clears throat> the title because um, I think it has like four different meanings. Um, so the Great Leap is, um, you know, obviously a reference to the Great Leap Forward, which was uh, this economic industrial policy put in place by communist China in, uh, what was it, 1958 to 1960 was the time mm-hmm. period. Um, it's supposed to increase production and industrialization in the country. Um, and it ended up with 20 million Chinese people starving to death in that time period because of these policies and because of other things. But um, so, you know, the, obviously some a lot of this play is about China and Chinese Americans and a, a big chunk of the play takes place in China in the midst of this um, political unrest. Um, so there's obviously that kind of straightforward. Um, and then, it, you know, obviously that's very relevant then great leap could also be kind of looked at as a athletic term, basketball term. You have to leap a lot in sports or basketball specifically. Um, and then also the great leap as in like taking the great leap, taking the leap. Um, you know, we see that in, in Wen Chang specifically, but, um, you know, are you, are you going to stand still for your whole life or are you going to take that leap and do something scary and go out there and, and do something that you really want to do, even if, you know, bad things could potentially happen because of that. Um, so yeah, I think it was a very smart title. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there was a there's a there's a couple of like really introspective lines in this play that really had me stop, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> and and one of them was. And I felt like this was a very, in in the air of the coronavirus and in the air of the uh, political events that have been happening in the U.S. over the last couple months, um, there was a line towards the end of this play. It was a dialogue exchange between Wen Chang and Manford. And um, one of them says, quote, fear can keep you alive. And then the other one says, or keep you from living. And I was curious um, for, for the group here, what do you think, what you think is more true in the context of today? Does fear keep us alive? Literally fear, the fear of, you know, catching this virus, then this global pandemic, you know, that, that fear can keep us at home, which therefore keeps us alive and the people around us, or does it keep you from living? Because, you're so scared or because the the nature of the world around us is so scary, you know, what, what do we, what, where do we go from here? You know, what, what is more true? I, I think I'm just curious to see um, what some people's thoughts were on that. I feel like both, both have come into play in our lives in the last couple months in different ways, because I think specifically with the coronavirus, like fear is keeping us alive you know, like being, being smart and being aware and being cautious and being fearful of this thing is what slows the spread. Then in other situations, um, specifically politically, you know, not being afraid to speak out and not being afraid to take a stance because for a lot of people, especially recently, it's their first time doing so. Um, because, you know, the biggest, theme that I at least saw in in circles around me was just it we can't be silent anymore we can't stand by and watch injustice being done or we are just as bad as the people doing the injustice and I feel like the Mm -hmm. the second idea of keeping keeping you from living is very relevant there because if you don't speak out if you don't stand for anything what's the point (laughs) and even though it's scary to do so we have to. You know, it, it, Katie, that's a great question. And it um, brings me back to the last scene right before intermission at the end of act one, when Connie comes to see Saul and she gives him, so Connie knows the situation that's going on in, in China. She knows that the protests are going on and that 
uh, protesters, bystanders are being killed, that it's very dangerous. And it's not the same as a protest in, you know, San Francisco would be that, you know, it's a, it's a very serious different thing. But she also knows that Manfred is resigned to doing this. So she brings the names of embassy workers to Saul and she encourages him to contact them and make sure they know that he's there and that he, um, if he needs anything, he can contact them. Um, So she's kind of bridging that gap between she's afraid. She tries to talk Manfred out of it a little earlier, um, but seeing that she can't do it, she wants to provide him with the tools that he needs to stay as safe as he can. And she knows that if she gives that information to Manfred, that, he's not going to do anything with it. So she goes above his head to Saul to give him that so that if he needs to contact any of those people. So I think that it's a balance between being afraid, but using your fear to help make the uh, right kind of decisions, kind of like we're, we're doing through this pandemic. Hmm. Yeah. I think Julia, you touched on um, like the difference between smart fear and dumb fear, I think is um, I think is the, the big thing. So, you know, what are the what are the benefits of going and doing something and what are the repercussions of going and doing something and right now the repercussions should far outweigh the benefits of going out massless going to indoor whatever um and now you know i can't i can't say that especially when chang's position you know the repercussions could be his life so it's hard for it's hard to you know it's 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 easy to say you should always stand up for what's right and you should always, you know, go and be with your family or whatever it is. But it's hard without having ever been in that situation, knowing that you could become an enemy of a uh, of a country and be killed for that. It's hard to say, you know, what kind of decision I would make. So I don't know. I, I mean, that kind of um, I'm not that familiar with him, but the, the basketball player Ines Cantor. Ines Cantor. Yeah. Right. From what Turkey. country? Turkey. And and the, and the Turkish government they don't like him because he he speaks out and that he's had a lot of trouble, um, you know, governmental trouble with them with that that has been serious. You know, I'm sure he's had uh, threats to his life about that, and he is here, so he's feels probably a little more able to stand up for things. Mm -hmm. Uh, But a a very similar thing that, you know, when a when a government, when a dangerous government opposes what you have to say, it's it's hard to hide your, you know, it's hard to put your fear aside. I must say, going into reading this play, I I really had no expectations at all. I I didn't know really anything about what I was about. And and this play uh, runs very deep and it is a very... uh, it's a it's a quick read and it's a hard read. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. really hard to read through it and read through some of the lines in here and not take a second and stop and say, whoa, this is there's a lot going on here. And we're talking about a lot of very serious historical events. Um, and and what I love is that it doesn't really seem like it's aimed at people who are aware of these events. It really seems like it's aimed at people who don't really know the history of, mm-hmm. um, of you know, just everything of, of China and all of these horrific protests that happened in, in, in the 19, late 1980s, and early 1990s. Um, it really feels like its target audience is not the people who know it very well, which I, I love um, because it's really teaching you know, it's teaching a whole group of people about something they probably wouldn't have expected when they picked up a play about basketball. I'd love to ask you you all about that final image of Wen Chang and um, just what your thoughts or feelings or reactions to that moment in the show um, and how, like, I didn't see it coming. I didn't see a building to it. I really, I really liked it because I think that even if you don't really know that situation, I think almost everybody has seen that image and knows essentially what was going on there. Um, so I think it was really, I, I think it's really smart to to call it back to that, and then to bring it back to basketball 
is the the last stage directions in the whole thing is it's a screen screen another word for a pick pick and roll and so you know as the screener as the person setting the pick on the court you're sort of sacrificing your body that's you know that's when you have to cover your penis because you you're there's literally a, a defender running straight into you as you let the your teammate the guy with the ball go around and and try to score and then maybe you roll and you know try to help but you're essentially putting putting yourself on the line to help other people get through um I, I just think it was, I, I would be so interested to see the staging of the end of this play um, and different people's interpretations of that to see, to see that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It was not something I saw coming at all. And I was going to bring up that exact same point, Jack. It is metaphorical in all of the best ways, in the worst ways, uh, but the best ways theatrically. Um, and it was... It was something that I love um, as an actor, uh, my favorite types of shows to be in, my favorite types of shows to watch, my favorite types of shows to direct, to design. My favorite types of shows are the ones that leave the audience going, whoa, what? Like, even if they understand it, to mm -hmm. just be like, hold on. And, and they have to actively think about the show after the show. And that makes them wanna have conversations about the show. And that, is how change happens, is through conversations. And that is how we learn about different people, about different things, about different points of views and perspectives. Um, and, and I think that this play sets that dialogue up really nicely with that final image. I, I like it as well, because I think, so I, you know, I'm a fan of Lauren Gunderson plays and she does a lot of historical fiction kind of things where a character is someone who existed and she imagines what has gone on. And I, I'm a big fan of that. Um, and I love that. I, it makes me wonder if in this, if in this play, um, Lauren, he was thinking of the man known as tank man or unknown protester and thinking like, what's his backstory. I, I always like to give backstories to things. So I, I'm wondering if that was part of what she did and built a backstory around it. Um, but what's interesting to me is that in, so this, that guy is known as tank man or unknown protester in history. So he's, he is just a representative of all the protesters. So he can stand because nobody knows for sure who he was. He can stand in to be anyone. So it's an interesting um, flip to give him a persona, but in, but in doing that, it also makes um, Wen Chang be a representative and, you know, a, a general representative for the people of the country. So it kind of, it's this like intertwining thing where we give uh, specificity, but it leads to generalization. Um, you know, Julia, you, you, or Jack, I think it was you, you just touched on different things you'd like to see with the show design-wise. Um, and I was curious as to if you had any thoughts about how you would like to see this show staged. I saw a couple um, pictures of a production of this show um, that looked like it was, it was like a, a basketball court painted on the stage. Um, I'd be interested in... in doing this production like in a in a gym in a basketball gym i'm not the sound would probably be terrible but people could figure it designers are incredible they could figure it out um but especially because in the description she says that there's a feeling that they're being watched and so i wonder about doing this sort of in the round in a in a real gymnasium i think could could be really interesting uh, again back to that every scene is a showdown it's a one-on-one -on -one who's going to come out on top is is a, a parallel to basketball so that would be that would be interesting to me one one thing that i was thinking of and i'm not good at this if i've seen a show many times i can think of what i liked and didn't like so i could probably i've never directed anything i could probably direct almost main or i could probably direct rent because i've seen those a billion times and i know what i like and what i don't like about what i've seen but it's hard for me to take something brand new and develop something but one piece of this that i was really thinking would be cool would be to have wen chang's apartment um let's say stage right elevated 
and um, a, like a frame of a window because his apartment overlooked Tiananmen Square. So I have a frame of a window, but that frame faces the audience so that the action in his apartment are, and, and so it's elevated so that because he's above Tiananmen Square so that we as the audience are kind of those protesters or the people who can see. So you can see into his apartment for those scenes that take place there and that he's, you know, when he's writing the, these le- this letter, he could be sitting kind of right in front of it, right in front of this big frame. So that that was a piece that I thought would be kind of cool. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. Thank you. I have um, two ideas. Yeah. And one of them is a little more nuts than the other one. So I'll start with the crazy <laughs> one first. Um, but I would love to double cast this. And at the beginning of every show, have the two um, characters who are playing the same role play a game of knockout. And whoever wins plays the role that night. <laughs> <laughs> Not That's horse, just, only knockout. I mean, knockout because you've got the two people like dribbling furiously and trying to get the basket. I don't know. I thought that'd be fun. That one's more goofy and less significant than the other one. But, um, <laughs> the other idea I would have is in the game scene. I I can see a lot of really great sound design things happening, but in that scene, have a dribble and a dribble, and it gets faster and faster and faster until. They get to the line, there he is, and then you hear the sound of a ball going through a hoop. Mm. Mm. I just saw that moment very clearly in my head. Yeah, nice. I like, I like it. Yeah, um, I I agree with you, Jack, in, in that the description at the beginning of the play, um, Lauren Yee says they can be playing basketball or they don't have to. Um, and I just 1,000% want to see them play basketball. Mm-hmm. I want to see a full on basketball game um, because, you know, like uh, in plays with sports, um, what tends to happen is that you don't see the other team. You see the team that, you know, you're learning about um, and you don't get to see the people that they're playing against. Um, and there have been a couple of plays that I've read that include sports um, in which that's the case. And um, obviously it's for casting reasons. There's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. So it makes a lot of sense. But I just think that this is a play that is different than the others. And I feel like that is imperative to have um, because there's so much more at stake here than just a game. It's about something far deeper uh, and far scarier. Um, And I think we need to see the uh, what's at stake for the team if they lose, if this, uh, by, by seeing it play out. Um, I also agree, I would love to see this in the round and I would love to see like maybe, you know, like this is obviously probably Broadway level stuff, but like removable um, netting almost that can go over um, so that they can be actually playing basketball. And if they miss, if they, you know, do anything, there are no audience members in danger. I would love to see audience members elevated, just like you would have in in a in a basketball court. Again, for safety more than anything else, they're not going to get hit um, that way. But I also think that um, I would. There's a lot of really good places for dramatic lighting shifts here. Um, some really good places for dramatic lighting shifts, specifically because there are a lot of um, you know, Wen Chang, he delivers this monologue about his relationship with Manford's mother, and he's kind of switching back and forth between delivering to the audience and just kind of talking to himself and telling the story. Um, and obviously, I think dramatic sh- lighting shifts back and forth and back and forth is too much. Um, but I think with the right coloring and with a lighting designer, an actual lighting designer and not just me, um, they would be able to find like a creative way to do that so that the audience, it's not like uh, I'm talking to myself and now I'm going to be talking to somebody else and I'm just going to shift my body. And that's how you're going to tell, because that's a very stereotypical way to change who you're talking to. And I would just like to see something different. Um, I just think that that would be interesting. And I, uh, to your sound cue that you uh, had kind of talked about, Julia, I I think that there are a lot of places here where the sound of a basketball can be overlapping with the sound of a heartbeat, especially as stakes kind of get higher as the game gets closer. 
Um, I would just love to see like an elevated heart rate almost going with the basketball. I think it could bring another just element of reality into some of it in those moments that I think uh, are taking us away from what's happening in the country. And obviously that's a stylistic purposeful choice by Lauren Yee, but I'd be interested to see if it's too much to have something like a heartbeat or if it, you know, adds a different perspective and element to it. Um, I think it would, I could see it working and not working, you know, um, I'd be interested to try it at least. Um, does anybody have any ideas for dream casts? You've got all the people in the world. Who do you want to see in this, in this show? Um, I had, I had, um, a few, I think that Manfred should be a real high school or college basketball player that I don't have like a specific name, but I think it's important that he is actually a really skilled player. Um, and hopefully a skilled actor as well. Um, so that would be, that would be my thought. Um, I also, I mean, I like the casting of BD Wong, so I think I would just keep that. Um, and, uh, in in reading Saul, I just I think he's probably too old for it now, but I just kept reading uh, Billy Crystal in that role. Me too, <laughs> Jack. I wrote that down. <laughs> yeah, I think he would need to be about ten years younger, but uh, but yeah, that was that was just my thought constantly. I saw um, Christopher Sieber as uh, Saul. Oh. Ooh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's you a know, great. He played, casting he played choice. Lord Farquaad, so he can do that kind of over the top. And then I was thinking a little more because I did see uh, the show Allegiance, um, which is about Japanese internment camps. George Takei uh, made this musical. It's it's beautiful. Um, and while I was watching it, because there's over the past few years, there's been a lot of talk about appropriate casting for for um, cultures and races. And in Allegiance, which is a Japanese, it is about the Japanese American internment. Um, in world, around World War II, some of the actors are not necessarily Japanese. There, there are uh, Filipino, um, Vietnamese, Chinese people in it, but Asian. And I, and this is a topic for another time as to um, you know how how that leads to appropriate or inappropriate casting. Um, but I decided to use that knowledge that that's been done recently to kind of expand a little. So um, I loved the show, The Good Place. And I thought that um, Manny Sinto would be a great Manfred. He's twice the age of what Manfred should be. So that is a problem. But that he's 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 a very smart guy. So he's capable of all, all that Manfred has to offer. But he's also skittish and a little impulsive. And, you know, he can be funny and, and uh, he's got great physical acting and things like that. So all, although, and, and Manny Jacinto is part Chinese and part Filipino. Um, but I, I was thinking of him when I was um, reading this for the Manfred role. And for Connie, I was, I was thinking of Aquafina actually. Me too. Um, I thought, yeah. I thought that Aquafina would be a good, you know, I don't know if it's, if that role has enough lines for someone like Aquafina to do that, but that's, that's who I was thinking of. I I had I only had two that I could think of um, that I felt would be could be a good fit. Again, I think he's a little too old for it, unfortunately. But I think that he has the uh, just the the I don't even know what word I'm looking for. He just it just feels right, um, and that's Mandy Patinkin as Sal. Mm. Um, I feel like he has the ability, I guess, to sort of play those really inappropriate and dirty kind of role and he's a loving man and he's a kind man and I think that that kind of balance can work really well with that character because he's Mm -hmm. obviously not a malicious character he's sort of the villain I if you will of the show but obviously in every villain you have to like them enough to like want to care what happens in the story and I think Mandy Patinkin can bring that like kind of level to it but I think he might be a little too old um, and the other one that I thought of for Wen Chang, I would have loved to see him as Manford, but he's also too old. And I think he could work for Wen Chang as Harry Shum Jr. Um, I said him he, too. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, his like most, you know, famous thing is, is Glee. Um, but he, uh, is, a, he's proven himself as a, an incredible actor. Um, and he's obviously very athletic as well, which certainly doesn't hurt 
um, for the character of Wen Chang um, being the basketball coach. So uh, th- those were the only two I could really think of. Yeah, I I had a couple for Manford. I was thinking it's tough because Manford's supposed to be a bit shorter. Um, but Ross Butler has really mm-hmm. been up and coming recently. Um, and then Hudson Yang, I think, would be great. Mm-hmm. And he is actually 17. So mm-hmm. he's the perfect age for this. And he's a little shorter, too. So I was like, oh, but he he has that, like, vibrant spirit and energy that I feel like this role requires. Um, and then for Connie, I was thinking either Gemma Chan or Janelle Parrish. Mm-hmm. Um, Janelle Gemma Parrish, Chan was cool. in Captain Marvel. And Janelle Parrish was a part of Pretty Little Liars. That's probably what she's best known for. But she was also in To All the Boys. Um, mm. And then I couldn't think of any for Wen Cheng. I feel like that one was really, really hard to cast in my head. Um, but for Saul, I said Billy Crystal. He was first on my list. <laughs> and then someone who's actually age appropriate would be John Favreau. Because um, I think we've seen John mm. Favreau play a lot of... Mm-hmm like dad roles um but he also has a lot of fire in him and he's a very blunt actor and Mm -hmm. i mean if he was in it i feel like he could also direct it as well which would be cool (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah um well i guess that that sort of brings us to the most important part of the podcast um which is which is calls to action I, I feel like there were conflicting messages in this play. Sometimes a play will have a very specific moral to the story. Um, but I feel like the two opposite themes that went on throughout this are how, you know, how it starts at the very beginning where um, Wen Chang says, you Americans are always running. You can never wait your turn. And then Saul says, it's always your turn. So they each follow that at each of those pieces of advice at different points throughout the play. And it has different outcomes, positive and negative. So I didn't feel like if those were the themes, there's not one that wins out in the end. But um, even though it may have a negative outcome, I think everyone in it decides to, you know, as Nick, as Nike says, just do it, you know, take, take your chance when it's time to take your chance, even if it's not going to have a positive outcome. So that's that's my takeaway is if there's something you need to do, you just you really need to do it. Um, mine was um, about forgiveness. Um, and I think uh, my biggest takeaway was if if you have wronged somebody, do everything in your power to make it right and ask for forgiveness. That doesn't mean you're going to get it and that doesn't mean you're, you're going to deserve it. Um, but I think as we see in the the relationship between Wen Chang and Manford, just not doing anything about it, just letting it simmer for 17 years and not making any attempt, I think makes things, makes things worse in the end. I'm not saying that anybody necessarily deserved forgiveness, but when you start to make an attempt, eventually down the line, maybe there's, there's a relationship that can be there. So. Yeah. Um, that's great. That's a great, both of those are really great um, messages. And, and you know, one of mine is is similar to yours, one, Lori. Um, I have two. Um, but, you know, my first one was that there's a quote in it that said, um, they said, quote, they don't always want to choose to throw and then miss. Sal visits uh, China the first time um, and meets Wen Chang and they're discussing the game of basketball. And Wen Chang says something like, well, I don't want my my players to, I don't want them to choose to throw and then miss. Like, why would they do that? Um, If they're going to throw, they better score as kind of the hidden, you know, meaning behind that. And my call to action is to choose to throw it anyway, whether you're going to miss, whether it's going to land in the basket, you, you have to do it anyway, do the thing that scares you. Um, we all, me, me, Julia, and Jack had an acting teacher once who said, um, go before you're ready. And he would say it all the time. Um, he would say, go stand on stage and go before you think you're ready. And um, that I think that really helped me a lot because I, I in general, I just, I'm an overthinker, always have been. Um, and, 
you know, I'm, I'm going to miss. I'm going to fail. I'm going to face embarrassment. We all are. We're going to dislike the choices that we make sometimes, you know, unprecedented choices that we make. Um, but eventually, m- myself, everybody else, we will succeed. We'll grow into new dreams. We'll learn to enjoy the moment. We'll, we'll live our life and find the adventure, meeting new people, you know, facing these fears as they come to us. And so my call to action is to choose to throw it anyway. Um, and my second call to action is that this show made me aware of my own white privilege. And obviously it's something that I'd like to think that I hope I'm, I'm pretty aware of. And I think in the world today, um, the word privilege has a very negative connotation to it. And I don't necessarily think that it, it needs to, um, you know, ultimately all that it means is that you are, you have things that some other people, people don't, and that doesn't necessarily mean something bad, you know, it just is what it is. And, you know, being a female athlete, I've been a female athlete my whole life, obviously, you know, you know, sports are a little bit harder for women, but in general, um, you know, like the amount of, of, of racist events that happen within sports, like we don't know the half of it, you know? And, um, especially with like Sal's character here, he just, the things that come out of his mouth are so horrific sometimes. And it is scary to think that that is what Lauren Yee chose to put into the show. Those are selective things that she chose. Imagine all of the things that happen that we don't see, that we don't know about because we are not informed about it. And, you know, especially right now, there's a lot, not necessarily um, everything that we see, but especially in social media, there's quite a bit of like performative activism of people feeling like they're very aware and they're, you know, going to stand up against injustice. And then when the time comes for them to stand up against injustice, and we've all been guilty of it, I've been guilty of it, we don't do it. Um, and, and so I think here, this is this play really makes me want to do it. And again, to go back to the first one, choose to throw it anyway, even if, even if you're scared to speak out and do, do whatever um, you think is right, but you're scared of the consequences of it, choose to throw it anyway and stand up for the people who, who need, need some more people behind them backed in their corner. So I like it. My, my call to action is, is quite similar to Katie's in that after reading this, I reflected and I was like, I, I don't know as much about world history as I should. I, I don't know as much about the history of other countries and other cultures. And so my, my call to action is to educate myself because it's not the responsibility of someone from that culture to have to educate me. I can, I can go educate myself. Um, so that was that was the biggest thing that stuck out to me is something I can actively do after reading this play. And then the other thing that's a little more abstract is this idea of like loving things from afar. Like I, I was listening to this this podcast or this interview based on a movie that I had just watched. And one of the actresses was like, I as a parent, you can never love your kid too much, you know. And you, you regret not putting the time in. You regret not going to see that game or not going to see that recital. So the biggest thing that hit me about Wen Chang's character was that there was all that time spent loving from afar instead of loving up close and personal. And so I, I just want to make that effort to tell people I love them, to let them know. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, so do Lori, Jack, do you want to, um, tell our folks who are listening, um, again, maybe just a brief little bit about your show, where they can find it, um, all of that good stuff, maybe what, what your next episode is going to be when it's going to be released. Yeah. So, um, again, our, our podcast, our podcast is called Family Court Vision. Uh, it's me and my mom. We talk about basketball, the NBA, the WNBA, we do. We usually talk about the basketball news of the week, and then we do a movie review, and then we do some kind of fun game at the end, usually. 
Um, and uh, we record on Wednesday nights. They usually come out the, the next day or Friday. So Thursdays or Fridays is normally our release day. Um, so we actually, we should have one coming out tomorrow, I believe, um, or the next day, uh, which is a really fun one. Um, we review the, the 1985 movie Teen Wolf. Yes. That, so, yeah. that, that joy of a movie. Yeah. Woo. That was something. So if you've ever seen it or if you haven't, you could, uh, you could find out whether you should. Yeah. That's what I actually have seen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. So you can, you can find us on, on Spotify, on Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, um, you can email us at familycourtvision at gmail.com for any mailbag questions you might have or any you, thoughts you, you want can, to share with us. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at, at famcourtvision. Yeah. So check us out. We thank you for, for giving us this platform yes, to talk about thank it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Oh gosh, yes, we are we are Family Court Vision, the mother of all basketball podcasts. <laughs> we That's love us. a good pun here at Play Day. <laughs> we do. We love a good pun. That is awesome. And yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Julie and Katie, for having us today. I, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. For Thank you for here. being here. Yeah. I this could was... talk with you two about plays for another like seven hours. And I <laughs> this was well, very, let's fi- very Let's find cool. some more basketball plays. We could do this more often. You know? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this week's play date. You can follow us on Instagram at playdate.podcast for updates, giveaways, and more fun stuff. Our cover art was designed by the amazingly talented Haley Denton Hughes. And our theme music was composed and recorded by Mickey Wadsworth. I'm Kate. And I'm Julia. Keep playing. <laughs>